When Christians have been wondering what to do with dinosaurs, the evolutionists unfortunately have been wise as serpents, but not as harmless as doves. They have realized that dinosaurs, it went a little bit too far there, let's see, anyway, I guess this isn't going to go in reverse, oh, it is going to go in reverse, wow, you guys are praying out there, okay, (laughs) all right, they realize that dinosaurs fascinate children, and they have worked hard to make dinosaurs the icon or the trademark of the so-called fact of evolution. So we have to realize that Christians are not the only fishers of men. We can turn the tables, though, by using dinosaurs for what they ought to be, and that is evidence for creation and not evolution. They point us to the greatest book of science and history that's ever been written, and that, of course, is the Bible, which I don't seem to be getting the effect on this anymore. There we go, by golly. Better late than ever. Okay. (laughs) The Bible, of course, is not a textbook of science, but considering the author, it ought to at least be accurate when it touches on matters of science and history, and as we shall see, indeed it is. Now, dinosaurs have been found on every continent of this planet, even Antarctica, and that bothers some people. They figure we've got to give some kind of answer because they're everywhere, they're everywhere, what are we going to do? And unfortunately, many Christians have kind of pooled their ignorance on the subject and come up with a lot of ignorant speculations about the dinosaurs, which is unfortunate. We should go to the Word of God and to the creation science that we have today and find there are very good answers. But some honest, well-meaning Christians have actually said, well, uh, you know, the evolutionists use dinosaurs, don't they, to deny the Bible and promote evolution? So it, <laughs> that's not very good. We don't have to deny the evidence. The evidence is real. Our response should be that we have a better explanation. Others have said, you know, the devil put those bones in the ground just to throw us astray. <laughs> well, you've got to give the devil his due, but the Bible doesn't say the devil did that one. Now, others have gone so far as to say God himself put those bones in the ground just to test our faith and see if we would believe his word even though the evidence contradicts it. Now, what kind of God would do that to us? We have enough tests of our faith without God doing that to us. So, I don't think that's quite the case. Oh, very good. We're getting close. Keep on praying. (laughs) Okay. Uh, What our answer should be is that those bones are in the ground not to test our faith, but rather to support our faith. If biblical history is true, creation took place. What would we predict about the fossil record? The fossil record would show no transitional fossils. And indeed, there should be many millions, but there's only a handful that they're even worthy, uh, willing to argue about today. And they're so questionable, so equivocal, that many evolutionist experts don't even accept them. Well, that's what creation predicts. Secondly, if there was a great global flood, these fossils would be buried in sedimentary rocks, which is exactly what they are. Creation and the flood at face value, prima facie evidence, is right there, right in the rocks, crying out the biblical truth. Now, unfortunately, Many Christians have been intimidated on this subject by the so-called fact of earth history and science called the evolutionary geological column. It is prominently displayed in our textbooks, in our museums, in our national parks. It looks scientific. It even sounds scientific because they use Greek names like Paleozoic, which means ancient life, Mesozoic, which means intermediate life, Cenozoic, which means recent life. But there are a lot of good, solid, scientific, and logical reasons not to believe this. The first and most important one is it denies the testimony of the one eyewitness who was really there to tell us about history. It denies the words of our creator, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 6, that, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Well, this says, if Adam and Eve came at all, they came at the end of time, billions of years removed from the beginning of the creation. Again, in Luke 11, 50 and 51, Jesus said that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, shall come upon this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. It's like from A to Z, from the first prophet in world history to the last prophet of the Old Testament. According to Jesus, Genesis is real history. He ought to know he was there. And he said his first prophet, Abel's blood, was shed not billions of years after the foundation of the world, which is what this teaches, but at the foundation of the world, at the beginning of time, just like Genesis says. Now Jesus, as C.S. Lewis said, is either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord and God. If you're going to call him Lord and God, you better believe what his word says. He said to Nicodemus, I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. How then can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? If God can't get the plain mundane facts of history of how and when things took place straight, 
He has no authority to tell us anything else. His authority has already been uh, disparaged by the fact that he can't even get history straight. Well, that's not the problem. The problem is that this masquerades as a scientific fact and truth, when indeed it doesn't really exist as depicted in the textbooks anywhere in the world. If it did, this thing would be nearly 100 miles deep. The average fossil bearing rock strata around the Earth is between one to one and a half miles deep, not nearly 100. They take the thickest exposures of certain rock strata that has certain extinct fossils like trilobites or whatever, and the thickest layers they find, they assume were at least that thick in the past. But it got eroded here and there over millions of years, and here and there it escaped erosion. So the thickest ones are how old it really was, how thick it was. Assuming all that, that assumes the old age of the Earth, that assumes evolution, assumes all the things they're supposed to be proving. They then put these things hypothetically, <coughs> excuse me, on paper, and by the time the thing is done, it's nearly 100 miles deep. Not only that, where we do find it, such as at the Grand Canyon, the whole top of the chart is missing. We have the fossils in the wrong sequence and even in reverse order of how they're supposed to be evolved. That's true hundreds of times around the world. They claim overthrust put them in the wrong order. Well, how do you know what order is the correct order? The order that agrees with their preconceived idea of evolution, stage of evolution, symbol to complex over time. It is very mixed up and very contradictory. It only looks perfect on paper because they force the evidence to bow before their preconceived ideas, their preferred prejudice theory. They don't let the evidence sit in judgment on their theory. Now, basically, we can ask this question, since they're using evolution to put the fossil record in this artificial order and to ignore the many contradictions to it, we can ask this question, how do you know that theory is really trustworthy in the first place? Their amazing answer is, well, evolution is not a theory. It's not a hypothesis. It is a fact. And you know how we know it's a fact? Why, because we have this beautiful column here that proves it's a fact. Ah, and how did they get that column? By assuming evolution without proof and using that to put the puzzle together, ignoring all the contradictory evidence. So the main proof for evolution is the assumption that it took place, because they must assume it in order to put the column in the order they want, then they use the order of the column to prove the very theory they started with, arguing in a circle, begging the question, logical fallacy, circular reasoning. Now I find when most people assume what they assume, they usually assume more than they ought to assume every time they assume what they assume, at least I assume so. So we don't have to be afraid of people using assumptions and circular reasoning. Now, to show that I'm not just pulling your leg, we'll quote some evolutionist authorities in this regard, admitting that this really is a problem. Carl Dunbar, author of the Historical Geology textbook, second edition, he says here that no single area contains a record of all geological time. We need only discover and correlate enough of the what? The scattered fragments. Ah, that's what it really looks more like, not this beautiful column all over the place, to build up a composite record of all geologic time. He continues, for more than a hundred years, the geologists of all countries have been cooperating in this endeavor, and the total thickness of the stratified rocks now recognized would exceed 500,000 feet, or some 95 miles, if all the beds were directly superposed. But just how bad is it worldwide? The creationist geologist, John Whitmrappy, did exhaustive research actually documenting the written admissions of geologists worldwide as to just how out of order the fossil record really is. From their own published admissions, he gleaned this synopsis. Two-thirds of Earth's land surface has only five or fewer of the ten major geologic periods in place. Eighty to eighty-five percent of Earth's land surface does not even have three geologic periods appearing in correct, and that means evolutionary consecutive order. A significant percentage of every geologic period's rocks does not overlie rocks of the next geologic period. Some percentage of every geologic period rests directly upon Precambrian basement, the supposed oldest basement rocks of life. So Woodmrappy concludes, and I would concur, that since only a small percentage of the Earth's surface obeys even a significant portion of the geologic column, it becomes an overall exercise of gargantuan special pleading and imagination for the evolutionary uniformitarian paradigm to maintain there ever were geologic periods. It's an idea imposed on the record of creation and the flood and it doesn't fit, but they don't let you know that they're using circular reasoning to build up a phony column that is contradicted by the facts, and they're letting their theory sit in judgment on the facts. In real science, the facts sit in judgment on any hypothesis. But they love their hypothesis, they don't want to give it up for anything. So they just hope you don't ask these type of questions. Now, if man and dinosaurs were created together, you might ask, why don't we ever find human and dinosaur fossils buried together? human artifacts and things like that buried in lower layers of the geological rock strata. Well, we have found a few dozen examples of this over the past few centuries. 
Uh, it's even re it reported in some secular books, uh, like Ancient Man, a Handbook of Puzzling and Artifacts by William Corliss, and Forbidden Archaeology by Thompson and Cremo. But here's one of the most spectacular cases. Ten human skeletons, five males, three females, one infant, buried in solid, undisturbed, homogeneous Dakota sandstone within the same layer that runs continuously across Utah, even transcontinental, and runs right through Vernal, Utah. Dinosaur National Monument, chock full of dinosaur bones. Now this would be expected to be rare, but it wouldn't be unheard of if the Bible is true. I just ask people to look at this video or DVD with a halfway open mind and see what you would think if you hadn't been brainwashed by evolution. Now, God made them according to Jesus Christ, male and female at the beginning of the creation. But we can ask this question, on what day were dinosaurs created? Okay, I wonder if our battery's going dead. There we go. On what day were dinosaurs created? Some people say, oh, we don't know. We don't know anything about dinosaurs. The Bible is strangely silent about dinosaurs. Well, actually, we know what day they were created on because the Word of God reveals that he created all land-dwelling animals on day six. Dinosaurs are land-dwelling animals. That means they were not only created in the same week as Adam and Eve, but on the very same day. Now, if men and dinosaurs were there from the beginning, the very same day of creation, we might ask the question, why was the word dinosaur reinvented in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen in England? Well, because they rediscovered dinosaurs as fossils. Now, Sir Richard Owen was a Christian man of science. He should have known better. He should have read the Bible and said, hey, these creatures must have been here from day six. Maybe the ancient scholars and scientists named them already, and I believe they did. I believe the word dinosaur is found more than 25 times in the Bible, but not by the name dinosaur, for the same reason we don't find the word television or computer or space shuttle in the Bible. These words weren't invented until after the Bible was written. And this word dinosaur was invented in the middle of the 1900s. So it wasn't around when the Bible was written, but there were ancient words for these creatures. The ancients used the words draco in the Greek and tanim in the Hebrew. This Hebrew word tanim used more than two dozen times in the Old Testament. Draco, from which we get our English word dragon. That goes way back in antiquity. Every nation, tribe, and tongue has stories about dragons that sound like dinosaurs. Even Carl Sagan said, boy, they sound so much like dinosaurs. We're going to have to give them some kind of an answer because it sounds like the Bible. And we sure don't want to believe the Bible. We'll look at that closer a little bit later. But Draco, from which we get the English word dragon, that is how that word tanim was translated by the King James Bible almost in every instance. And that was in 1611. The Astoria Animalium, a secular zoology textbook, not a fairy tale book, said that dragons were real. They were going extinct by the end of the 1500s. They had gone extinct in Europe, but they were real animals. Learned scholars who had studied would have known that. And the scholars at the King James translated tanim as dragon, the old world term, I believe, for dinosaur. Now, books that deal with dinosaurs from a correct scriptural and scientific point of view, Dinosaurs by Dine and Dinosaurs of Eden, both very good. Dinosaurs in the Bible by Dr. Kent Hoven, very excellent video for the younger children, Marty and the Last Dinosaur and Marty's Fossil Adventure. And for the teenagers, Creation Adventure Team, award-winning videos actually keeps the attention of teenagers, a minor miracle in and of itself. <laughs> and for the youngest children, we have A is for Adam and what really happened to the dinosaurs. Now that's a good question. What happened to the dinosaurs? There are scores of different theories purporting to explain what happened to the dinosaurs, why they disappeared. Some of them are pretty exotic. One of them is that all the dinosaurs used to eat a certain laxative plant. And when that plant went extinct, all the dinosaurs perished from fatal constipation. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I don't know if you could think of a better theory than that. But the big theory today is that an asteroid or comet hit the Earth, kicked up dust, got dark and cold. The cold-blooded dinosaurs couldn't handle it. They went extinct. But we have crocodiles, alligators, Komodo dragons. These are supposed to be, date back even before some of the dinosaurs, and they're still here. The asteroid didn't wipe them out. I wonder why. See, man's theories don't always explain all the facts. So instead of man's theories, man who wasn't there, let's go to God's word who was there, and he tells us there was a great catastrophe on purpose. And that was the great Genesis flood, and that's why there's billions of dead things buried in sedimentary rock layers laid down the water all over the earth, including dinosaurs. Now some Christians go, oh, that must be it. God must have said, Noah, those dinosaurs are too big. Just leave them off the ark. They'll go extinct. That'll be the end of the dinosaurs. But the only way we know what happened is to let God tell us, because he was there and we weren't. God specifically commanded Noah to take seven of each kind of the male and his female of the clean animals, so long as they were land-dwelling, air-breathing beasts of the earth that breathe through their nostrils. But even of the unclean, 
and that includes all types of reptiles. That would include dinosaurs. Even if the unclean, at least two of each, the male and his female, if they're land-dwelling air breathers that breathe through their nostrils. Now, how many dinosaur types would Noah be allowed to leave off the ark according to that explicit command? Not one. You would have had to have taken them aboard. So we should always see pictures of dinosaurs and pterosaurs going aboard Noah's Ark. That's God's revelation. Now some people say, oh, they're too big, they wouldn't fit. But actually not all dinosaurs were big. And even the ones that got very big started out small. So you take them while they're still small. Uh, most reptiles can reproduce at a young juvenile age. They don't have to be anywhere near full grown. Plus they grow as long as they live. So the really huge ones we find in the fossil record may have been centuries old at the time they got buried in the flood. At any rate, the average size of a dinosaur, believe it or not, is somewhere between a large dog and a small horse. Most of them weren't big. The big ones were famous because they got so big, but most of them weren't that big. And even the big ones, if you take young ones, would easily fit aboard the ark. Now, predictions. If this is true, what would we expect? We would expect that after the flood, we would see evidence of men and dinosaurs coexisting in biblical history, in secular history, in archaeological evidence, and in forensic evidence from dinosaur bones that they did not go extinct millions of years ago. Well, let's take a look first at biblical history, Job chapter 40, verses 15 through 19. Here, God is calling to Job's attention his, greatest, his greatness through the things he has created, and God points to the greatest animal of the animal kingdom, the biggest, most powerful animal, the behemoth, which in Hebrew means a big, monstrous animal. He says to Job, look at the behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox, what strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are close-knit, his bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like rods of iron. He ranks first among the works of God. In the margin of your Bible, some say, well, it was a crocodile, elephant, or hippopotamus. But you know, crocodiles don't eat grass like an ox. And elephants and hippopotamus don't have a tail as big as a cedar tree. And they don't have bones as strong as iron, and they don't rank first the preeminent, biggest, most powerful land-dwelling animal that God ever made. I think it's describing a sauropod dinosaur. Now, when we look at the posterior of the elephant and the hippopotamus, my goodness, what pathetic examples of tails. <laughs> I think if God was talking about them, he would have said this, Behold Job, he moveth his tail like a twig. <laughs> but when he talks about this, he'd say, hey, that's like a cedar tree. So, as the old proverb says, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, flies like a duck, it's most likely a duck. In this case, behemoth is most likely a sauropod dinosaur alive in the days of Job after the flood. Now, the very next chapter, Job chapter 41, God calls to Job's attention the greatest reptile of the sea, the Leviathan. Okay? Now, contrary to what some people think, Leviathan is not an annual marathon run only by the tribe of Levi. Okay? <laughs> Wrong idea. Leviathan was an awesome aquatic reptile that had such thick scaly armor, the Bible says no weapon of man could penetrate it. No spear, no arrow, no harpoon. Impervious to human attack. Yet you read in the margin of your Bible some speculations. Maybe Leviathan was a whirlpool, or a whale, or a crocodile. None of which fits the description. You know, whirlpools don't have scales and teeth. Whales don't have scales. And crocodiles have been killed with simple weapons like spears for thousands of years. Notice what God says. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook? Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. His sneezing throws out flashes of light. His eyes are like the rays of dawn. Firebrands stream from his mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from his nostrils. His breath sets coals ablaze and flames dart from his mouth. Sound like anything we've heard of in antiquity? Fire-breathing dragon. All these stories from antiquity of dragons that sound like dinosaurs, some of which could breathe out fire. Of course, God can make anything. I believe this is probably one of these big... Marine reptiles, Mosasaurus or Chronosaurus, with glands to produce flammable chemicals and electrical spark for ignition, you have a flamethrower. Of course, God can do that. We have that technology in the uh, electric field. Some people thought it was too shocking when it was first reported. But uh, <coughs> God can do that type of technology. In fact, God can even make a dragon, so to speak, of the insect world. It's called the bombardier beetle. The bombardier beetle has a complex chemical factory that produces reactive chemicals, hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone, held inert until it's squirted into a combustion chamber, an activating enzyme then causes enormous, almost instantaneous increase in heat and pressure that explodes out a twin cannon in his rear end right in the face of any predator coming after him. <coughs> he can shoot up to 30 times repeatedly, boom, 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 boom. Makes him the Rambo of the insect world and nobody wants to tangle with a bombardier beetle. 
But if God could do that with a one-inch beetle that's indigenous to the temperate climate zones around the world, and in fact is found down here around San Diego, so don't go walking around barefoot or you'll find out the hard way they're around here, uh, what could he do with a 20 or 30 ton Leviathan? He made the fire-breathing dragon. Now, in this excellent book, The Real History of Dinosaurs, Dr. Mace Baker, creationist dinosaur specialist, he points out that the Hebrew words tannin and tanim in the Hebrew should be translated by the modern word dinosaur. He makes a strong hermeneutical and linguistic argument for that. He also quotes ancient scholars who described what dragons looked like in their day. Yeah, their description sounds like known types of dinosaurs. So I would agree with Dr. Henry Morris, who said if one will simply translate tanim by dinosaur, every one of the more than 25 uses of the word becomes perfectly clear and appropriate. Dinosaurs are in the Bible, but they're there by the ancient word, not the modern word that was invented after the Bible was written. Now, if men and dinosaurs survived the flood, we might expect to find artistic depictions of dinosaurs in archaeology. And indeed we do. Man is by nature artistic. This ancient cave painting from Zimbabwe shows what appears to be a Tanantosaurus type of sauropod dinosaur. The evolutionist said, it's some strange mystical creature. Would you ask any kid, what does that look like? And they say, it's a dinosaur. See, kids are often smarter than our scientists. So <laughs> that was in Africa, here in North America, Havasupai Canyon near Grand Canyon, ancient Indian petroglyph, outlined in white to make it clear. But it is the profile of a dinosaurian creature, very similar to the known dinosaur Edmontosaurus. Here we have an ancient Roman mosaic from the 2nd century AD showing two long-necked dragons fighting or playing on the banks of the Mediterranean Sea. When we look at the foot structure, the joint structure of the leg, the layout of the body, the length of the neck, it is an uncanny, very accurate depiction of a known type of seropsid reptile known as the Tanistrophius. How in the world did they know that? Were they just lucky in their guessing? Or maybe the Historia Animalium is true, that dragons were real. They existed up to the end of the 1500s in Europe, and that history agrees with biblical history. Now on the left here we have Dr. Don Patton. <coughs> Dr. Patton is a creationist geologist from Dallas. He heard about this ancient Indian petroglyph in Colorado, just across from the Utah border. He went to photograph it. He noticed the local people call this the Triceratops petroglyph because it has three horns. Triceratops in the Greek means three-horned face. Armored plate behind its neck, a Triceratopian type mouth. And uh, no wonder they say it looks like a Triceratops. The evolutionist said, no, no, the ancient Native Americans never saw a Triceratops. Why, they were just trying to draw a goat, you know? It's just a goat. But if you look above it, you'll see the ancient Native Americans jolly well know what a goat looks like. <laughs> so I think it's a Triceratops. Just a few years ago at Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah, we finally located a petroglyph first located by the evolutionist, but they despised creationists, so they wouldn't tell us where it was. We had to find it on our own. It's outlined in white to make it clear that it is definitely the depiction of a sauropod-type reptile, like an apatosaurus. Now, here we have the actual photo. It's a little bit faint, but you can see there's the eye and the mouth. There's the neck. Here's the legs up here, tip of the tail here. And he's next to an Anasazi Indian warrior in their kind of stylized depiction of themselves. We know this is not modern graffiti because it's thickly covered with this reddish chemical compound called desert varnish. And this takes centuries to slowly build up on the surface of desert rocks. When it's this thick, it easily dates back more than a thousand years to a time when the climate was better and the Anasazi culture, as well as apparently some dinosaurs, were still thriving in what is today a very austere desert area. Now, the Nazca Indian culture of South America is distinguished by having dinosaur motifs found often in their tapestry and their pottery recovered from their ancient tombs. Now, a reptile is a dinosaur not because of size, but because of anatomy. Technically, if we found a reptile no bigger than a mouse that had dinosaur anatomy, we would have to call that a dinosaur. It's not a size issue. The movie Godzilla said size matters. Well, it does with Godzilla. It doesn't matter with dinosaurs. You can be small. Some dinosaurs were no bigger than chickens. We know that. Now, this reptilian creature has legs directly supporting its body like a horse or a cow. That's dinosaurian anatomy, not crocodilian. It has a long articulated neck structure, definitely dinosaurian, not crocodilian. And it gets almost infinitely better than that. Centuries ago, during the days of the Spanish conquistadors in South America, the Spanish occupying the ancient Inca Empire kept a history of the Incas called the Chronicle of the Incas. In there, they have a passage where they mention the Incas were fond of etching stones with pictures on them, rounded river stones, and then burying the etched stones ritualistically in their tombs. They said most of the pictures were understandable, 
But some of them were of strange, monstrous, reptilian, dragon-like creatures that the Spanish were not familiar with. And they even sent some of those stones back to Spain for analysis by the scholars in Spain. We're hoping if we can get permits to go through some of the ancient Spanish archives, if it hasn't been destroyed or thrown out over the centuries, we might find those original stones. But it was graphically illustrated, graphically described by the Spanish centuries ago, centuries before the middle of the 19th century, when dinosaurs were rediscovered as fossils. Now that's interesting, because we would predict, if the Spanish are correct, that when we find and excavate Inca tombs, we would find these etched stones. And indeed, we have found them, literally by the tens of thousands. And between 20 to 30 percent of them, on the average, have images on them that look like this. Gee, I wonder what those strange mystical creatures could be. Well, they're unambiguous depictions of known types of dinosaurs. So unambiguous that the evolutionist knee-jerk reaction was, well, it's a big fraud. Somebody's done a fraud here. Those ancient Incas could have known what dinosaurs look like. According to the Bible, they could have, because they survived the flood. And they perhaps only recently disappeared and went extinct. Well, you've got to think about this. If it's a fraud, you've got to have a motive, you know. Uh, if you're going to do a fraud, rule of thumb is you make one or two only. You don't make them by the thousands to devalue them and then stick them in Inca tombs that are hard to find. You know, how do you cash in on a fraud like that? Who would go through all that time and effort and what are they getting out of it? What's the motive? And how in the world did the Spanish accurately report it centuries before dinosaurs were rediscovered in the fossil record? Doesn't really sound like a fraud. Well, they have these on display in the city of Ica, Peru, at the Cabrera Museum. In fact, the History Channel went down there. And they showed on an episode called UFOs in History. <laughs> they showed a stone like this in the Cabrera Museum. And in the corner, it had what looked to me on the stone they were looking at. It was covered with dinosaurs like this, the one they were looking at. But in the corner, it had what looked to me like a broad-rimmed hat. That's what I thought it was. They said, oh my goodness, here it is, spitting image of a flying saucer. Ancient Incas, 15 centuries ago, saw flying saucers. Now, they did not say one word about the rest of the stone that was covered with dinosaurs. I thought, what in the world? You know, it reminded me of the scene out of The Wizard of Oz, you know, where the wizard is behind the curtain running his machine, putting on his show, and then Toto comes and pulls the curtain back, and they can see, ah, what's going on? So he pulls the curtain in front of him, and he yells into the microphone, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, just look where you're supposed to look, and nowhere else. And that's what I felt like, you know, look at, look at this little thing that looks like UFO, forget all the dinosaurs. Well, if you ever get down to Peru, you can go to the museum founded by Dr. Javier Cabrera. Dr. Cabrera was an MD, founder of the largest teaching medical hospital in the country of Peru, and a qualified uh, archaeologist and anthropologist. He did massive excavations back when it was legal if you found an Inca tomb. It used to be legal that you got to excavate it and keep all the artifacts. And he has the largest collection of these type of pre-Columbian artifacts in any type of private museum in the world. He recently passed away, but his family is still running the museum. It's still open to the public, if you ever get down to Peru. Now, Dr. Cabrera, very respected academic down there, he was not a creationist. He was an evolutionist. Yet he said his archaeological findings forced him to concede Darwin was wrong about one thing. He was wrong in assuming dinosaurs went extinct millions of years ago. He believed everything else about Darwin, but he said that part has got to be false, because the ancient Incas obviously were intimately acquainted with known types of dinosaurs. Now, in his collection, he has many of these, thousands of these Inca burial stones, and many of them do show men and dinosaurs rather intimately acquainted. For example, here, we have an ancient Inca riding elephant style on a creature with three horns, an armored plate, and four legs. Well, we all know what that is. It's a triceratopian dinosaur. Now, it also shows us smoking went back quite a few centuries. <laughs> but according to the Bible, who were the first non-smokers in history? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> Didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. What's really fascinating here is that this artifact, recovered from a tomb 15 centuries old, has got these dermal frills on the back of dinosaurs. We did not know they had that anatomical feature until the 1990s. They're made out of skin-like material that usually rots. It's not preserved in the fossil record. But in the 1990s, we found some of the best preserved dinosaur remains, and we realized a lot of sauropodian and ceratopian dinosaurs had that feature. BBC came out with their special, Walking with Dinosaurs. And they were trumpeting how proud they were to have the most anatomically correct depiction of dinosaur anatomy in world history, according to them. Well, I would beg to differ. I think that these ancient Incas, by eyewitness knowledge, had a better representation many centuries ago. Because 
they knew something we didn't know. We, they didn't have just dead bones and fossils to look at. They had the real thing. Apparently, this type of dinosaur could be domesticated like an elephant as a beast of burden. Not all of them apparently were domesticatable, though. This guy's kind of having a bad day. He's about to get his leg bit off here. So he figures I better stab the dinosaur in the head with his trusty knife. But his friend has come up behind him. There's his eye and his mouth. He's about to get bit in the back of the neck, and that'll ruin your whole day and your whole life. So this may be his epitaph, how did our dear brother buy the farm? Well, here's the story in this tomb of how he bought the farm. Now, they also might have warning signs back then. You know, when I drive down the freeway, there's signs, look out for deer, look out for elk. When I was up in Alaska, it was look out for moose and grizzly. Well, they may have had ones like this. Look over your shoulder, there might be an allosaurus behind you. Don't want to get caught from behind. Even more significant are the finding of many baked clay figurines three-dimensionally depicting dinosaurs. These are extremely significant because baked clay can be dated by an entirely ind independent dating method from carbon-14. Carbon-14 is well known to give spurious dates even on artifacts of known antiquity, known date. However, thermoluminescent dating is based on the luminosity index or energy trapped in the crystals in the clay. It's pumped in, so to speak, when they fire heat the clay. So you can tell how long it has been by how much energy has leaked out of the crystal over time from the time it was fire heated. Now that seems to correlate pretty accurately on known dates of pottery in antiquity. So when this was found, the evolutionists said, ah, great, we'll prove it's a modern forgery. We'll use our marvelous, modern, accurate thermoluminescent dating. And when they did, it turned out to be many centuries old. All of a sudden, they didn't want to talk about it anymore. Isn't it interesting? Well, it, we have many of these examples of baked clay figurines in Dr. Cabrera's museum. Many of them show men and dinosaurs are interacting. Here, the Inca stabbing the dinosaur, but the dinosaur is getting his licks in as well. I guess we'll call that a draw. Here they're going after the babies. It's easier to get them when they're babies than when they get big and step on you, I guess. But you know, these people did not know it was politically incorrect to live with dinosaurs. They just portrayed life as they knew it, and these creatures were normal to them and are part of their normal culture as they depicted it. Now here we have the local Inca veterinarian trying to uh, nurse a sick dinosaur. He's got a bag here, perhaps of herbs or medicine of some kind. Now he's not sick because his legs were broken. That happened in an earthquake. But uh, we see this very domestic relationship that they had. Here again, we have them riding the Triceratopian dinosaur. We see the dermal frills that we did not know about till the end of the 20th century. I think these people knew because they were eyewitnesses. Not just in Peru, but also in Mexico. In Mexico, they have found tens of thousands of baked clay figurines in El Toro Mountain outside of Acombro, Mexico. If you draw a straight line between Guadalajara and Mexico City, about the middle of that line and a little bit north of it is a little town called Acombro. In 1945, a German immigrant, Mr. Yulesrup, riding along the side of that mountain, saw a little landslide had revealed baked clay figurines sticking out of the soil. He began to excavate. Decades of excavation have now been done. Tens of thousands of these have been recovered. And many of them show known types of dinosaurs. Not only that, thermoluminescent dating dated these to be a few thousand years old, more than twice as old as the ones in Peru. Now, what's really interesting is that the Acombro Indians depicted sauropods doing maneuvers that we didn't agree was possible until the end of the 20th century, when final analysis, computerized analysis of anatomy confirmed the greatest bone mass and muscle strength located in the loins allowed these maneuvers. Well, apparently they knew it, not by computer, but by eyewitness knowledge. Also, their depiction of the Iguanodon dinosaur was better than we had until the latter part of the 20th century. So Richard Owen first tried to reconstruct Iguanodon. He had a tail drooping and a little horn on the end of his nose. Then they realized they didn't have a horn on the end of their nose. They had thumb spikes, the kind of defensive weapons. But they had him on two legs with his tail dragging. Finally, by the late 20th century, we figured out it had his tail straight out and it walked like this. Now does this look like this? Yeah, the Acambro Indians had better knowledge than we did to the end of the 20th century. Now, <clears throat> this is very well documented on these two videos and DVDs creation evidence from South America, and mystery of a combro. This one in particular is extremely well documented, well, best, as good as it gets as far as archaeological finds, plenty of living eyewitnesses still. Their attempts to disprove it totally backfired horribly in their face. It's as thoroughly established as we can, I think, do anything in archaeology. Um, Unlocking the Mysteries of Creation has some of these photographs. I'm currently sold out of that, but it's on the order form. Notice the well-known old science book, The Astoria Animalium, claims that dragons were still not extinct in the 1500s, but the animals were said to be extremely rare and relatively small by then. Well, after the flood, lifespans decreased, size decreased, tremendous change in the climate and ecology of the earth, I think, precipitated that. 
And I think dinosaurs eventually went stink extinct in Europe, like the historian Adam Allium said, because of overhunting. They're having trouble adapting to the harsh world after the flood, and man pushed them over the edge of extinction in Europe by overhunting. Man has caused a lot of animals to go extinct by overhunting. With teamwork, with poison tip weapons, man can kill the biggest of animals. Now notice Carl Sagan, he wrote a book called The Dragons of Eden. In there he said the pervasiveness of dragon myths in the folk legends of many cultures is probably no accident. It is a worldwide phenomenon. And this bugged the dickens out of him. He said, why these dragon legends, they sound like dinosaurs. They sound almost explicitly in some cases, like known types of dinosaurs. He said, and yet it can't be that the Bible is true and dinosaurs were created with man and survived the flood and all that, that can't be true. So he said, how do we explain this from an evolutionary point of view? So in this book, one of his main theses was, well, these ancient people didn't realize that dinosaur and reptile brains evolved all the way up to human brains. And so they had a latent vestigial memory in their brain of when they used to be dinosaurs. And this reptilian section of their brain prompted them to have nightmares that they were fighting and battling with dinosaurs. And that's where all the dragon slayer myths came from. Believe it or not, notice what he said. In the dreams of humans, the dragons can be heard hissing and raspings, and the dinosaurs thunder still. Well, I think the Bible has a far better explanation than that. But you know what? Carl Sagan got the Pulitzer Prize for this incredible book, which goes to show that if you sing the song the world wants to hear, no matter how ridiculous it may be, you will get rewarded for it. Now, Bunyip's and dinosaurs. Bunyip is a name given by the Australian Aborigines for a big reptilian swamp monster that was in their swamps in the middle of the... Uh, 1800s. When white settlers moved near that area, one of them found a huge, fresh, unfossilized bone. He asked the aborigines, what on earth kind of monstrous animals run around your swamp here that have bones this big? And they said it must be the bone of the bunyip, our swamp dragon. So the Geelong Advertiser newspaper got fascinated. They said, well, we want to know what this bunyip monster looks like. So they interviewed Australian aborigine eyewitnesses, got all the eyewitness details. Then they made a composite sketch of what a bunyip looks like. This is a copy of the actual sketch published in the year 1845. It is a museum quality, accurate in the minutest detail, depiction of a known type of dinosaur, a duck-billed dinosaur called a hadrosaur. Now, this is an amazing thing. It's not a dead fossil. The Aborigines knew it as a living, walking, breathing creature. And yet, this particular type of dinosaur had not been discovered until 13 years after this was published. Finally, someone found it in the fossil record and reported on it. It was unknown to science. But the uh, aborigines knew it not by just a fossil. They knew what a living one looked like, and I think it's because the Bible is true. These creatures survived the flood. They lived with man for a time. They were going increasingly extinct, but apparently they were still there in Australia in the middle of the 1800s. Now, a medical pathologist examined dinosaur bone under a microscope and found dinosaur red blood cells still intact inside the bone. In other words, forensic evidence that these dinosaurs did not go extinct millions of years ago, but within the life and memory of man, no more than thousands of years ago. Here we have an actual photo micrograph of what appear to be red blood cells inside a blood vessel. These are within an unfossilized section of bone from a Tyrannosaurus rex. All tests to date have been consistent with the finding that the red blood pigment hemoglobin is also present. How then can this dinosaur bone be millions of years old? Not just the hemoglobin, but also osteocalcin protein in the bone. Now this is virgin bone, not permeated by minerals. So the proteins there have not been replaced by minerals. They're still intact. The problem is we know that protein bonds rupture with time, especially <clears throat> the covalent bonds of DNA, the bonds between the nucleotides, but also the bonds between amino acids in proteins. When they rupture, they liber liberate a small amount of free energy. Therefore, according to the second law of thermodynamics, they have to rupture the bonds with time. It's just a matter of time. Like water has to run continually downhill, not uphill, and the more time there is, the more downhill it will run. Well, the question is, how long does it take for all these bonds to rupture? In seeking to find the answer, scientists examined mummies. Ancient Egyptian mummies that we know historically are about some 4,000 years old. They compared them and their protein structure with mummies less than 1,000 years old to see how much protein bond rupture would take place in the 3,000-year hiatus. They found even in dry mummified conditions, the protein bonds were rupturing at such a rate that it appeared the proteins would completely be dissolved, all the bonds ruptured, no complete intact protein in as little as 50,000 years. 
DNA with its covalent bonds that are even more delicate, it would only take 10,000 years. 10,000. Yet here we have largely intact hemoglobin and largely intact osteocalcin protein. Now they did four different tests trying to confirm that it was not hemoglobin because they didn't like it. All the tests, however, came back positive. The most significant one, they injected some of this into laboratory rats to see the response of the rat's immune system to the protein intruder. Now God has given us and animals amazing, complex immunity systems that are actually able to analyze a foreign intruding molecule, an antigen, then by analysis figure out a molecule custom made to fit its three-dimensional structure, bind to it, and target it for destruction by the immune system. When they injected it into laboratory rats, the rat immune system analyzed it as a protein that was a hemoglobin protein, largely intact and targeted it in that way. That's about as good as it gets in forensic science that is largely intact. In fact, it's in about as good a shape as the ones we find in the ancient mummies, which we know to be only about 4,000 years old. Well, the flood, according to the Bible, was between four and 5,000 years ago. So that's spot on for these things being only several thousand years old. They find these bones of the dinosaurs and they say, that proves the rock is 65 million years old. But the bones have a different story. The blood has a different story. When Cain slew Abel, God tried to confront Cain about the murder. And Cain had this lame excuse, I don't know what happened after all, I'm not my brother's keeper. But God had the irrefutable comeback. He said, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And here we have the voice of dinosaur blood crying from their bones, telling us they're only thousands of years old, not millions. Also, we have found many dinosaur bones that are, in fact, not fossilized. Even the evolutionists admit this, lots of them. They look like old bison bones. They look that fresh. Yet they're supposed to be at least 65 million years old. Well, they would have been a pile of dust in a few tens of thousands of years by protein bond rupture. The fact they're in this good a shape indicates the dinosaurs could have lived no more than a few thousands of years ago. Finally, the ultimate question, could there be a living dinosaur today? According to the Bible, that's entirely possible. After all, they survived the one big catastrophe that hit the earth, the flood. They overspread the earth from the ark after the flood. If some of them migrated to areas sparsely populated by their main nemesis, their main antagonist, the dragon slayer, man, why, they might still be alive today. And indeed, there are such reports in the Amazon Basin of South America, and especially the Likawala Swamp of the Congo of Africa. Dr. Roy Mackle, the author of this book, he was professor of zoology at the University of Chicago and an evolutionist. And yet he was an open-minded evolutionist. He said, you know, we were wrong about the coelacanth fish. We were wrong about the tuatara lizard. We were wrong about the Komodo dragon and so many other things that the natives in the area told us were still alive and we were too educated. We thought, ah, they've been drinking their bath water. They don't know what they're talking about. We know what evolution says. And he said, time and again, we've been proven wrong because we're so prideful we won't listen to what the natives say. He said, the natives here in the Congo have been giving reports for more than two centuries of a creature they call Mokili Mabembe, which means he who blocks the flow of rivers. And he said, the description they give sounds like a sauropod dinosaur, like an Atlantosaurus or uh, some variety of an Apatosaurus. So he said, we got to at least check it out. After all, it might be true. He raised his own money, he went on an expedition, he went clear down into that swamp, and the picture that he put on the front of his book illustrates a story told to him by the pygmies there, how back in 1959, they surrounded and speared and killed a small Mokili Mbembe trying to break through their fishing barrier on the shores of Lake Tilly. They even ate it. I don't know what it tasted like, Bronto burgers or something like that. But they said that that was the main area where they were found. Well, Dr. Mackle penetrated further into that unexplored swamp than any scientist had ever gone before. He walked into a remote picnic village, and when he did, the whole village went in an uproar. Everybody began to jump up and down and scream and shout and holler and point and gesture at him and rush on him in one accord. And so he turned to his interpreter and says, do you understand their dialect? Please tell them I'm, I'm a foreigner. I don't know their traditions. If I've, if I've done something to violate a taboo, tell them I'm very sorry and I don't want to upset anybody. And by the way, do you even understand what they're saying? And the interpreter said, well, yes, Dr. Mackle, we know what they're saying. Basically, they're saying this. Come and look and see. You can't believe it, but it's true. The legend of the big, tall white man. They really do exist. One's walked into our village. You've got to look at him. <laughs> These people had never seen a white man in their life. Now, they'd heard stories, but it was, you know, to them like, you know, Paul Bunyan and Jack and the Beanstalk. Nobody takes those stories seriously. There ain't no such thing as big, tall white man. But then Dr. Mackle walked in their village and go, oh, my goodness, 
the legend is true. Dr. Mackel was very happy. He wanted people untouched by modern scientific knowledge. These people didn't have satellite television. They didn't have a subscription to National Geographic. They'd never seen a white man, and they ought not to know what a dinosaur looks like. So he called forward only eyewitnesses. He gave them a piece of paper, a pencil. He said, you draw what you saw, Mokili Mabembe. They would draw a very credible picture of a sauropod dinosaur. Well, Dr. Mackel was fascinated by that. He learned from them that Lake Tilly was one of the major haunts of this creature. He tried to make it up there, but he ran out of time and money. And so he had to return. However, two other expeditions did make it in the early 1980s, the Herman Regusters expedition and the Congo government-sponsored expedition, both of which were entirely staffed by evolutionists, zoologists, and biologists. They all came back swearing they had seen this living dinosaur, a small sauropod dinosaur in the vicinity of Lake Tilly. Unfortunately, their camera equipment was ruined and the film ruined when they had an accident that fell in the lake. However, they did bring back a tape recording of the deep-throated roaring sound this creature would make. It was compared with the voice print of any roaring creature on scientific record and was distinctly, uniquely different, absolutely not close to anything. Documenting in a concrete way, there's some big critter there that science has not documented yet. And the evolutionist's own eyewitnesses said it was a sauropod dinosaur. The Discovery Channel is now wanting to go there as a part of a new uh, series on documenting, proving or disproving the existence of strange, exotic, uh, you know, legendary creatures. They want to fly into Lake Tilly instead of walking through that terrible swamp on it with amphibious aircraft, stay there for weeks if necessary, use state-of-the-art infrared night vision equipment, etc., and prove whether or not it's real. The problem is we have a ter terrible civil war going on there again. And we need to pray that God will change the political situation and allow some of these major end-time revelations to be brought forth. Now, if you want a Christian witness to this, 42-year uh, veteran missionary, Eugene Thomas, he's now retired, but that's his address and phone number if you want to contact him. He said he had two pygmies in his mission in Congo, Africa, that claimed to have killed Amokili Mbembe in 1959. Here we have the Likawala Swamp. It's huge, twice the size of Scotland. It is 55,000 square miles, 80% still unexplored in in 21st century. Who knows what all could be in there. What's really amazing is flying reptiles are supposed to have been extinct for 65 million years, but they're mentioned by Aristotle, Strabo, and Herodotus. Aristotle said it was common knowledge that they were alive in Ethiopia in his day. Anybody who didn't believe that, he said, was simply uneducated. Strabo gave an eyewitness account of them being in ancient India in his day, and Herodotus gave a lengthy eyewitness account of them being in ancient Egypt, where he said they were hated and despised and killed whenever they were found. He said their bleached bones were found strewn across the Egyptian desert sand because everybody hated them. Well, no wonder they aren't there anymore. But they do appear to be alive and well in Papua New Guinea. Many people, hundreds of witnesses, including government officials, foreign missionaries, people whose credibility is beyond dispute, have seen these creatures. The government has issued challenges for foreign scientists, experts in capturing dangerous live animals to come to New Guinea. They promised to give them at least six permits, allowing them to capture six living pterodactyls if they can. They have to turn two of them over to the government, but they're allowed to keep four and export them even to foreign countries. Imagine that. We could have pterodactyls in the San Diego Zoo. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, so far, most scientists haven't taken it seriously. But the government is very, very uh, serious about it. They feel they don't care if this gives a black eye to Darwin's theory. They figure, by golly, uh, this is our national treasure. This is going to put us on the map. This is going to give us fame and fortune and tourism. And so they want it to be done. We do have uh, some creationist expeditioners gearing up at this time, raising money. I know personally one creationist who's gone there already privately and has seen one. He said that they glide, they dive faster than a falcon, over 200 miles an hour. He said you could not believe the speed that these things have. They have finally located, they believe, a cave where they're living. And that's better than we've ever had before. So we need to pray that, they, that we'll be able to mount another expedition, that the creationists will be blessed by God to get this documentation. Now, don't go out and say there's dinosaurs in the Congo and pterodactyls in New Guinea. It has not been proven beyond equivocation, but we could be about this close. And it's something we need to pray because, you know, evolution is the most successful lie the devil has ever spawned. And he does not like this type of evidence coming out. There really is a spiritual battle here. So I encourage you to pray and let's believe God for some amazing end time revelations. Revelations that will show that the Bible is true, not only trustworthy historically about animals, dinosaurs, pterodactyls, but the Bible can be trusted about the history of man, that man is not a worthless product of chance, that he is made in the image of God, that we are so valuable even in our fallen sinful state, that the Creator would pay the infinite price of the blood of His Son, that we could have eternal life. That's 
what's really important about the truth of the Bible. Well, I thank you very much for your attention. You've been wonderful. We've run out of time, and I hope we'll see you back at the book table and take advantage of some of the materials. Thank you.